intense paranoid delusions and terror. A methoxetamine trip report by Tony, posted to Earwid.org February 26, 2016. Quite a lot of what I experienced has been left out in this report, as at present, I'm still over 48 hours later in a state of mental shock after the experience, in which to relay some of the very negative effects, more than describe in depth the pleasant effects that are already covered in other reports on this substance. I do not think this compound can be trusted in my opinion. I've been accurate with my claimed dosage. I'm not exaggerating when I say I took close to a gram mostly sublingually over the course of perhaps four to six hours. It was bought from a reputable online vendor, and I have very little doubt about what I consumed being the genuine substance and as pure as is available. I have roughly a decade of experience with various drugs in varying degrees, including extremely potent things like freebase DMT and ketamine. I've never experienced the level of prolonged terror and delusion that came with MXZ. So here is my attempt at describing the effects. I'd planned on taking some methoxetamine and DMT together, as I'd heard this can be a very pleasant combination. I started off by taking 25mg sublingually, and after about half an hour, I was definitely feeling effects from it, and found it very enjoyable at first. My previous MXE experiences had been whilst under the influence of alcohol in a friend's house, and had very little recollection of what effect the MXE had on those occasions. I tend to black out when I drink. On this occasion though, I was sober, alone, comfortable, well fed, and generally in good spirits. My house phone was unplugged and I had nothing that I needed to do for the next day or two. I proceeded to take another 25mg sublingually, followed immediately by 20mg chopped into two lines for my nasal passages. The positive sensations increased and increased. At this point I stopped measuring how much I was taking and just started irresponsibly taking unknown amounts with no regard for whether it was safe or likely to remain enjoyable. Over the course of about four to six hours, I ended up taking very close to the whole gram of it, mostly sublingually, but also intranasally. All that was left of the gram when I returned to reality was a lion's were flying next to a blood-stained snorter. The effects I experienced ranged from very pleasant to extremely unpleasant and frightening such as the pleasant feeling that my consciousness was able to move at will from my body, inhabit other objects in the room, and that the couch I was lying on was something which I could melt right inside to at will. At one point, I was concerned that I was going to go too far and melt myself right through it, through the floor, and right into the downstairs neighbour's house. At times, I felt that everyone around me, neighbours and people outside, were able to hear my own thoughts. At other points, I felt I was God, and that I had direct control over everything in reality. I must say, that I am an atheist. I originally posted this on a DMT forum and got several responses from people who have experienced similar delusions with this drug. A couple of people said they could not understand how I was physically able to redose after initial consumption, so I think it's worth me adding here that my redosing required very little movement or perception of reality. It was simply a case of manoeuvring an arm towards my snake tank, where I had the powder laid out, and pressing my finger into the powder, then placing it under my tongue. I was largely incapacitated during a lot of the experience, but this was accompanied by periods of lucidity where I was able to navigate my house with serious difficulty, walking in spaceman steps like a badly programmed robot, and sometimes finding myself in different areas of my house with no idea how I even got there. My body froze in a contorted position, which would then snap out of and try to make my way back to my couch or bed. As things progressed, I started feeling that something was communicating with me. Eventually, this communication became very direct and was coming to me from a computer screen. I couldn't properly make sense of what I was being told, but I knew that I was being warned of something and offered a chance to escape it. Now that I've returned to baseline, I'm aware of how ludicrous these things are in terms of the physics of the material world, but at the time it felt as real as anything that I experience in day-to-day -day life. So what followed from some of these initial, mostly pleasant, although very strange effects, what I think can only be described as a psychotic episode, which lasted over 24 hours, starting from the very first dose of MXE. 
I started becoming aware of a humming noise, which I thought was coming from a computer, so I quickly turned it off. This never stopped the noise though. It continued to rise and rise in intensity. The hum was accompanied by bubbling sounds, clicks and mechanical scanning. I don't really know how to explain it with words. I spent quite a while trying to figure out where this sound was coming from and turned off everything electrical in my house whilst the sounds continued to escalate. I don't know at what point my brain made the jump to what happened next, but I'll just tell it as I remember it. I became aware that the sounds I was hearing were neither internal to me nor coming from anything in my house that I needed to turn off, but were in fact coming from outside. I started being able to hear people screaming and shouting. I looked out my window and could see people running around in a panic. And this was when I realised what was happening. My neighbourhood was being invaded. The sound I was hearing was the sound of spaceships approaching, and they had now arrived and were wreaking havoc on the people in the houses around me. The earlier communication I'd been getting via my computer was the aliens attempting to warn me, offering me some solace from the fate that awaited the rest of Earth's inhabitants. The scanning sound was them trying to detect consciousness within the houses, and when they detected it they would then extract the person from the house, taking them away with presumably bad intentions. Needless to say, I was utterly terrified by this point, and was not thinking or acting rationally at all. I was eventually standing pressed against the wall in the hall in my house, the only area with no windows which somehow made me feel a little safer. I held a knife in my hand staring at my door waiting for it to be breached by whatever these things outside were. A long while after this I started becoming aware that what was going on was almost certainly something in my head, and that the drug I had taken had probably triggered some kind of paranoid delusion or something. I was switching between being aware I'd taken a drug and completely forgetting that I was highly intoxicated. So it was then I decided to just go and curl up under a blanket and try to ride it out. I was eventually thinking quite lucidly and reasonably, but I could still hear all this pandemonium going on outside and was not entirely convinced it really was all in my head. So I just lay there for hours and hours until I fall asleep, terrified, shaking and confused. When I woke up a few hours later, normality had returned. Although my mind was still, and still is very confused, I checked how long this experience had been going on for, and concluded that it shouldn't really be classed as a bad trip, since it continued long after the effects of the drug should have worn off. It must have been something mental that had been triggered by that drug. I looked outside and the sun was shining. People were going about their business and there was no signs that an alien invasion had ever occurred. I'm shaken by what had happened, but relieved that it was all in my head, but also relieved that it wasn't a state of mind that remained permanent as well, since I do know of people who have had experiences like this, which have led to hospitalisation with schizophrenia, which needed long term medication and psychiatric care to get under control. I didn't think I was coming back from this at times thought I was possibly dying or even already dead. It seems likely that what I experienced was a combination of an overdose and a triggering of a latent mental problem. I have a family history of mental illness and a personal history of some mental instability, usually brought on by alcohol. But anyway, the experience was what it was and I thought it was worth sharing online as a word of warning to anyone else who thinks dabbling with a large amount of MXE will be safe, just because the drug is legal. It's a very powerful drug with little to no information, as far as I'm aware, of what possible long-term problems can occur due to using it. It seems to be a real brain fryer, and I don't think I'll ever take it again. People should be very careful with it, and make sure to stick to very small doses. I think if I had left it after the initial few measured doses, it would have been a very positive experience overall. The Illusion of Material Reality A methoxetamine and 2CB trip report, uploaded to Earwood by Vastness on December 20th, 2019. 
I feel like I might be saying this a lot recently, but apart from a fairly harrowing and difficult experience on another psych and dissociative combo recently, which was far more immersive and far stranger, this one was in a sense completely different, and also in many ways, so much more powerful because of the consistent lucidity of the experience. Some parts of the experience, as ever, defy words, and although at the time I wondered if I could change forever from this point forward, as ever, the descent back from the higher consciousness of the psychedelic state brings back all the illusions and trappings of sober life, and the accompanying doubt in the existence of anything beyond this thinly veiled illusion of the material. In any case, firstly, some backstory. I was not in the best place mentally. I'd been looking forward to a date with a very interesting and beautiful girl, which had been cancelled at the last minute, her having just started getting serious with someone else. I tried to stick to my usual routine of gym, meditation, positive habits and exercise, and thus had seen a friend earlier in the day and worked out for about an hour and a half. A relevant factor is that in the morning that day, I imbibed 200 milligrams of phenylparacetam and 100 micrograms of Adamax, a longer lasting analogue of the Russian nootropic Semax, as an exercise performance enhancer and slight mood lift. This was at about 9.30am. Five or so hours later, I was very tired and starting to feel quite down. Although I told myself I would not use any MXE for at least another few months, I did also use 100mg yesterday. I found myself automatically getting the baggie out and starting to cut 20mg lines. One note before we begin. Timestamps are essentially guesses. I didn't make any real notes, I just looked at the clock a few times. But I think they're accurate enough. T-1 hour. Pre-doses, MXE, analysis of potential interactions. I started dosing about 6pm, 8 hours and 30 minutes after the nootropics. Phenylparacetam has a half-life of 3-5 to five hours, so going by the approximate 5 half-lives rule for essentially total clearance, I probably still had at least 25mg in my body, although whether this was exerting any residual effects is an open question. Semax itself has a much shorter half-life of just a few minutes, although allegedly, its effects on the body can persist up to 24 hours, so it's quite possible this small dose of Adamax was exerting some residual effects on my neurochemistry. Anyway, while watching a show on Netflix, a hobby which I previously had something of a problem with, but have really made a solid effort at knocking on the head recently through practicing positive habits and attempting to always be present and not waste my precious time on earth, but this time I was allowing myself to indulge, just to self-soothe through external sensory distractions. I started out with 40mg, then I was dosing lines of MXE every 20 minutes or so, so I was done with the 80mg by about 7pm. Just prior to the last line, I started thinking that maybe I should take a psychedelic instead. I always feel dissociatives are somewhat dark, destructive drugs. Yes, maybe they provide access to a similar realm as psychedelics do, but they do so through twisted channels and at considerable psychological cost, especially for more habitual or frequent users, where the corrosive effects of the psychic intrusion, so to speak, start to cause wear and negative effects on the mind. This is true for most people, I think. Although, I don't doubt some people do manage to use dissociatives safely, mindfully, and while steering clear of them whenever the darker edges start to show. I personally just did not. Indeed, even using small doses of MXE, 100mg or so in a night, makes my bladder hurt a little even after a several month break from ketamine, which should be concerning enough for me to stop entirely, but it so far hasn't been. T0 hours, 24mg of 2CB. I've been planning to take a new 2CX chemical soon, but this night I did not feel up to taking something unfamiliar, so I settled on 2CB, a substance I have done a few times and which I find to be quite forgiving on the whole. I only took a small dose at first, around 8mg, and I then decided to up this with another 16mg, taking my total dose to 24mg of 2CB combined with 80mg of MXE. At first, I continued watching the show I was sitting through. It was a somewhat dark episode where a character just hung themselves, but I tried to just keep myself present, and began to think I was being shown this to remind myself that no matter how bad I thought things were, they were still a lot better than they could have been. I had, prior to this, been starting to feel quite good. A combination of the gentle come-up of 2CB plus the MXE starting to set in, although I did think initially that the MXE was feeling a little mild. Maybe a dose played a factor. Maybe the famous dissociative sobriety delusion, either of which could have contributed to my decision to take 2CB, which was rather spontaneous and unplanned. In any case, at this point, maybe 30 minutes into the 2CB, I was not getting any real visuals as such, 
but starting to feel a strange, slightly anxious feeling. Maybe not too unfamiliar with any psychedelic, at least for me. Finally, I decided I could no longer stomach the grim storyline I was watching, so I switched to something a bit more light-hearted. I found I couldn't really follow this, and in fact found the fast-moving pace of the pictures and colours a little hard to follow and disorientating, so I tried putting on some music. This was equally disconcerting though, so I shut my laptop and went to simply lie down, telling myself I was just going to meditate lying down and feel the sensations wash over me as they may. T plus one hours, question mark. Lying down with eyes closed. I lay down in silence and closed my eyes. At this point, the experience, I would say, although veering into somewhat uncomfortable territory, was still quite mild. With my eyes closed, I watched the movements of roiling shades of grey behind my eyes, like some kind of sea of liquid rubber suspended in white space, while various blobs connected and diverged from the other floating blobs with rubbery tendrils. I was starting to feel something else at this point, although I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was exactly. I decided rather than clearing my mind, to try to take a more active role in the experience, and try to feel my astral self and my chakras. I've been reading a little about chakras recently, and although I'm not entirely sure I believe in them, I had an insight of sorts during a period of sober meditation that appears to have benefited me in controlling difficult feelings in everyday life. So I tried to focus on my energy body. As I did this, the grey sea of blobs began to darken, and new colours began to appear. Bright colours of electric green and yellow, and blue and red. And I realised that I was no longer seeing the field of view behind my closed eyes, but a network of energy that was within myself. Honestly, the specifics of this experience, especially chronology, are somewhat lost in my drug-infused memory. But, I was vaguely aware that something magical seemed to be happening. I opened my eyes, got up and went to the toilet, and could feel that familiar, mild urinary retention and bladder twinge while urinating. This concerned me, of course, although it immediately struck me that it was not permanent. Nothing was. And this was a challenge that the universe itself had set before me. As long as I just don't do any more MXE, I'll be fine. T plus one hour and thirty minutes. Wandering. Entity contact. While I was walking out the bathroom, it was like my body was coursing with energy. Not all of it comfortable. Some of it I worry about having damaged my health in a way I knew I should have known better than to do. Additionally, just unidentifiable, uncomfortable body sensations. I decided to try and probe this further, and had an urge to just close my eyes, and try to listen into the sensation, to feel again, my astral self. During my sober meditations, as I mentioned, I became aware of some kind of tingling, erratic, unstable energy in my chest, which I identified as my heart chakra. Upon reading further, earlier while sober, an energy blockage in the heart chakra seemed to match a lot of the negative psychological issues I had been struggling with, and still am to some extent. Anxiety, demotivation, apathy, trouble connecting with others. And I was granted, thought of, had the insight into a visualisation I could do, envisioning a golden orb in the centre of my chest. Like I was consciously stabilising this blockage, and allowing the life energy of the cosmos to flow through me unimpeded. I've since been able to use this technique to bring myself back to the present, and separate myself from the ceaseless ocean of my seething human mind, with some successes I might say. In any case, I tried to begin with this, to feel the energy in my heart chakra, and use this energy to create a suction effect, to draw energy from the earth through my legs, abdomen, to the top of my head, and thus feel where my body was weakest. As this happened, it was like suddenly I was separate from this pain. I was within my body still, but I was also something else like I'd partially uncoupled my soul from its incarnate form, and I could observe myself, without judgement, objectively, and see the areas I was doing damage. Bladder, kidneys, lungs from the occasional cigarette. More general effects of poor health decisions in some sense. But for these moments, I didn't feel it. The same multicoloured fractalising ocean of blobs in blackness, like an infinite multidimensional lava lamp danced behind my eyes. I opened them again, and partially, came back to the physical. At this point, the open eye visuals were ramping up. I was seeing traces. No solid object was truly solid anymore. The black textured marble effects of my kitchen worktops were swirling and moving like water, and I realised at this point that everything was shimmering in the winds of eternity. My mind's filtering mechanism for the all-consciousness that pervades all of existence was no longer able to keep things constrained, and I felt like in a moment everything could just dissolve. Everything is surface detail, an illusion. 
but the illusion of time keeps us anchored to it. I felt like the veil of reality was becoming translucent, offering me the chance of a tantalising glimpse at what lay beyond. At the same time, my body was feeling like it was suffering somewhat, possibly under the strain of overstimulation from the MXE and 2CB combo, combined with the hour and a half of high intensity training I had done earlier, and probably not giving myself ample time to recover from. I walked back into my front room, slowly this time, trying my best to just be, not think of the past, the future, or the worries of the day or of life. Just focus on this moment right now, for this moment surely wouldn't last. But I was in a holy place of magic, and if I wanted to get anything out of it, I needed to not fight it. In fact, I had to savour it as best I can. But, as I mentioned, I do have some residual anxieties and fears I'm working through, which manifest typically as a tightness in my chest, which sometimes makes everyday life a struggle, even when it should be easy, or I should say, would seem easy to some. Sat down on my sofa and opened my laptop. Immediately after, I closed it again. Technology was not what I wanted right now. I had a few moments of apprehension, even fear, and I was considering if I could truly handle this, whether I should take an atizolam or valium of two to calm down. I told myself I would not, however. I've softened the majesty of such celestial experiences enough times already. It was time to brave this onslaught of divine grace with courage without diluting it with anything else. I had zero desire to do any more MXE at this point. Accessible though it would have been, I was probably still on it, that said, but wanted to have as pure as an experience as I could. I could see no way to distract myself or make it easier. So, I sat down in my chair, I usually used to meditate, again in silence, and closed my eyes. The visuals now had taken on a different character of sorts, of impossible shapes moving more slowly, but of incredible beauty. The tendrils within myself I felt before were now reaching out into something that was not myself. Something before me began to form a shape of indefinable dimensions, ever-changing colours, and some kind of background, slow music, like it was coming from a far distance started up in my head. Writing this now, I believe I heard this far more faintly than when I was first lying on my bed, but it was low enough in volume to dismiss. This time, it wasn't. This is some kind of celestial song of the universe or the divine that I often hear during trips, especially if I do them in silence. Although, to be honest, I do not trip in silence too often, but usually towards the end when I am lying down, trying to come down, I will hear this sound. In any case, this shape was a smooth fluid of electric tendrils branching out in all directions. It was somehow rotating, but in the same way that a shape of more dimensions than we can usually perceive would rotate. If you're not quite sure what this means, watch a video of a rotating tesseract or hypercube as visible from a three-dimensional observer. Look like that but far more complex, somehow with infinitely more vertices, corners, and possibly changing form as it went. The energy tendrils entwined with my own, and I felt their touch, and I immediately felt something not of this world. I could scarcely handle the electricity, which seemed to be filling my mind to the exclusion of all thought, all that I thought I knew, and I felt the telepathic communication from this being, or rather, a collection of beings, without words. But they told me that I had been put on this earth for a purpose, and that while I was on earth, I would not know them, I would not see them, and I would forget what I truly was. But everything is playing out as it always would. Everything was playing out as planned. No matter where I was in life, I was here for a reason. I was here because of the orchestration of forces I could not hope to comprehend. All this being the case in some sense, I recognised that I was a part of them, or had been at one point, and maybe would be again. At that point, I opened my eyes. Within the room before me was a translucent being, with some kind of triangular head, which seemed a more stable, less fluctuating and incomprehensible version of the shape I'd seen before. But the being was entirely translucent. If you've seen the camouflage suit in the film Predator, that's what they look like. My eyes were transfixed. I did not dare look around or away. In this moment, I had no doubt of the reality of this, but I also felt I should just not look away. The entity stood very close to me, towered over me. Not sure if it had limbs, but I felt it enveloping me with some kind of energy field. Maybe long, spindly arms. Maybe the same tendrils I saw before with my eyes closed. Out of the corner of my eyes, I could see more such figures, standing back, almost invisible in their translucent forms. Some anthropomorphic, some amorphous, some just something else. 
I had the sensation of being in the presence of the divine movers behind reality. No words were spoken, and I was frightened, but I did not feel any malice from these entities, only love. I had this sensation that some of these entities had been humans once. This was like an innate sensation, like my own soul could sense others of my kind, but some of them had never been human. Not that they were alien, maybe just never incarnate, truly of a different plane. At this point, I did speak, believing fully that I was in the presence of consciousness immaterial, that had transcended or just always been above this physical world. I asked if my father was with them. My father had died recently, about two years ago, and I was informed that he was. I'd closed my eyes again. The visual impact seemed to somehow cloud my ability to perceive whatever was coming through from behind the veil, and I sensed some kind of chatter, and was told that he was there. At this point, it was like I could suddenly feel his presence, although I couldn't see him entirely. The translucent shapes when I closed my eyes gave way to oscillating layers of colour, intertwining, overlapping, some kind of energy I cannot truly describe, but which I understood to be a conglomerate of all who had given me the gift of this vision, as well as some kind of higher reflection of individual consciousness from elsewhere in space and time. My father was very ill when he died, and not the person that he once was. We also had a very difficult relationship, for which we could be said, in some sense, to both share the blame. Although, I take responsibility for it, because I'm only responsible for my own actions. I then began to perceive a particular sheet of rippling energy move forwards to overlap most of the rest, behind only the oscillating hyper-object, which remained directly before me, seeming to facilitate this connection with the other world. Again, no words were spoken from the entities, but I sensed from them that indeed, my father was with them, and I perceived my father making himself known kindly, although he did not speak, indeed couldn't speak, for the veil could not be entirely surpassed, perhaps not even by these pseudo-gods or eternal spirits. T plus two hours, overwhelming emotional release. At this point, I found myself crying, something I have not really done since my father died. I bent over in my chair, opened my eyes and looked at the ground, immediately abashed to be given the audience I had been apparently given. I thanked my father tearfully for all he had given me in life, and said I was so sorry that I had not been kinder to him. As I spoke these words, I had the sensation that he understood, and more, and I would too one day, but for now could let it go, and I felt other entities voicing their input like a silent celestial cacophony of direct to mind silent sounds, overlaid with the celestial music and a new deep oscillation from the object that started to change faster and create a noise like of an oscillating piece of thick metal in air until it reached a crescendo and was gone. I suddenly breathed, great gasping breaths, sucking in air to take everything in, so humbled and awestruck as I tried to appreciate the majesty of what I had touched and what I had seen. I looked around the room and realised that everything was exactly as it was supposed to be. The moment is all there is, and this was the moment. At this point in time, I had no worries at all. I had absolute faith in the universe, myself, and God himself, herself, itself, that was on the only path I could be on. I had arrived here in the only way I ever could, and I would live my life in the only way I was ever going to, even if the future was uncertain, unknown, or simply forgotten to me. I got up just to try to orient myself after this breathtaking inner journey. I wasn't sure where I was going, but I walked back into the kitchen under the bright fluorescent light to look at the shimmering visuals. Everything was alive still and shimmering. While the entities themselves were starting to recede from my consciousness, I could still feel them just behind the veil. The room sparkled with magic energy, rippling again with waves from the ether that coursed through my mind and forced open the usually tightly closed filtering mechanisms that allow us to operate in sober reality. I realised I was now quite dizzy, even sick, like I might need to purge or throw up, collapse, lie down. I really didn't want to do this and tried to steal myself, bizarrely. I remember thinking I didn't want to embarrass myself in the presence of the gods, like this was a test to see if I was worthy to be given the lesson they wanted to give me. Suddenly, I just stopped still, standing bolt upright, looking at a white tile on the wall. This time, I felt another presence reaching through the void, one of something almighty, 
of inconceivable power, and as it observed me, the power of its gaze sent an invincible feeling of divine, otherworldly power surging through my limbs, and right then, I felt like I could truly weather anything. Indeed, I had a duty to, and I would be granted strength by God. I realised again that life was all around us, not as we understand it, but awareness, consciousness in some form. I also realised that I was but a vessel for the almighty Lord God of all creation. I'm using a somewhat Christian metaphor here, although I explicitly am not Christian. I don't subscribe to the Jesus mythology at all, yada yada. It's just what came to my mind, arguably because my upbringing was Christian. I just had to fall to my knees, and again I spoke. I said something like, I surrender to your grace. Use me as your vessel. I am your instrument on earth. I might have cried again while I said this. I felt honestly like a warrior for God. But the battle was life itself, and to live it, and exert my will in the only way I am able. I think some of this, I must admit, beautiful as the experience was, was the classic dissociative egotism creeping in and casting shade on the psychedelic experience, like I myself was unique and special, but my belief was not entirely egotistical in nature, for I understood at this point that this is true for all of us. We are all vessels, mere conduits for the universal, multiversal, omnipotent, self-creating Boltzmann brain of infinity itself. I touched the earth actually the tiles on my kitchen floor, and could feel the raw power of history surging beneath me. I knew I was not the first to be touched in this way, and I felt the strength of every strong, courageous, brave or good action taken by any human being, indeed even pre-human beings, that had brought me to where I was now. I've been feeling quite lonely, as I mentioned at the beginning, but in this moment again I realise that we are never alone. We are always surrounded by the souls of all who have come before us, and indeed, all who will come after us. Love is all around us, and all of us, no matter what our differences are, are working towards the advancement of life and love in the only way we know how, even when it seems we're doing the opposite. Everything happens the only way it can. T plus 2 hours and 30 minutes, breaking one of my golden rules of tripping and calling someone. I had the urge to call someone. I noticed with some surprise it was only about 9.30, so I'd been tripping for 2.5 hours now, although it seemed like a lot longer. As I say, at this point I had an urge to call someone, so I picked up my phone, put it down again quickly, and thought about that again. I have this golden rule, so as not to cause nuisance, embarrassment or fallout while in deep trips alone, which is to under no circumstances text, call or answer phones, unless it seems to be an absolute emergency and I was lucid enough that my previously ingrained safety subroutines were still intact. Whatever news this was that I wanted to share, it could wait until later. However, my sister texted me about something. I texted back that I loved her, and she immediately guessed I was tripping. I phoned, and we had a brief chat, although after voicing my love and finding she was actually about to drive from work and seemed a bit stressed, I felt a little awkward, so I quickly let her go. She was cool about it though and my decision to call her definitely was the minimum amount of fallout, all things considered. She might joke about it later, but that's it. Other options I considered were my mum, so glad I didn't do this, or a friend who actually is recently going through the whole AA, NA thing, so I did not feel it would be appropriate, and I might have perceived a judgy vibe whether imaginary or not. On hanging up however, the awkwardness was immediately dismissed, as I realised this was just another joke of the grand game of the human condition, an illusion of the mind. I realised as I started to come down that some of my anxieties about what I had done, my life, how I was going to operate tomorrow, work, etc, were coming back, but I was able to quickly dismiss them and just laugh. This is the cosmic joke of the game of human life. These things have been put here for a reason, challenges to help us grow and fulfil our divine purpose, and we need to live with them, overcome them. Indeed, it is our sacred duty to do so as best we can, and to help others to do so as well as best we can, but there is just no reason to surrender to them, only to surrender to the whims of the gods, the universe or fate, or whatever reality really is, which is surely something stranger than any of us can ever imagine. T plus 5 hours, coming down. I did start to feel very scatty, overstimulated, just not pleasant, and my bladder pain started to return around 12 midnight, 5 hours after dosing. I tried to just resume what I was doing, but was just feeling very restless, still quite overstimulated and uncomfortable. 
Eventually, I took 2mg of atizolam and 10mg of Valium to sleep. Day after and afterthoughts. I woke up early, and honestly, I've taken about the same amount of benzos, the enos today. I put this down more to the MXC than the 2CB, but I felt very scattered and uncomfortable, but also just great. Very, very grateful to be alive, and with an overwhelming love for everyone I know. I plan to make a point of telling all my friends and family that I love them when I see them next, which I never do, but we should tell the people we love that we love them. I won't say that this was so powerful it changed me overnight, but I have a resistance to such immediate change anyway, as drugs of course delude just as much, or arguably more often, than they offer us real insights. I prefer to let things settle and see what sticks. Honestly though, I think I'm done with all that aerial cyclohexylamines now. They never offer me too much that I don't believe could be offered in a more pure way with psychedelics alone. They are in many ways just pure self-indulgent hedonism, and most importantly, they make my bladder hurt even in low doses, which is surely asking for trouble. To continue this would be insane. Same goes for cocaine, minus the bladder thing. I won't say I'll never do any of these ever again. I know how fickle and changeable and forgetful the human mind is, no matter how profound the lesson. But it will be years. This is probably the closest I got ever to developing an actual, honest-to-God belief in God, afterlives, pre-lives, and an ethereal realm beyond what we can perceive in the material. I don't really know what to make of this now. I'm just so cynical and bound to neurological, mechanistic explanations of human interpretations of divine phenomenon. But during this trip, I felt without a doubt that God is real, that gods are real. Death is not the end. Ethereal beings are always with us, and that there is an ethereal plane inaccessible to us, but always around us. Is it true and not a delusion? Who knows? I guess it's impossible not to forget again once we return to a sober state. Our minds just naturally filter it out, or maybe start functioning normally again and separating reality from fiction. I hope you all enjoyed reading regardless. We are the gods, which is the universe. A magic mushrooms, 4-H-O-M-E-T, and methoxetamine trip report. Posted to earwood.org on February 23rd, 2012, by the user Mind Explorer. Background. I'm a psychonaut, and I've experimented with DMT, ayahuasca, MET, DIPT, shrooms, 4-H-O-M-E-T, 5-M-E-O-M-I-P-T, 2-C-D, 2-C-E, 2-C-I, 25-MBOME, MDMA, MDMC, 4-MMC, and MXE. I've used 4-HOMET three times, MXE three times, and shrooms a dozen times. I feel comfortable with those three substances, and I thoroughly enjoy them. Set. I've mentally prepared myself for this journey by decreasing my alcohol and marijuana consumption this week, as well as reading Plato's Republic and listening to Terence McKenna. Earlier today, I ran for 30 minutes straight, and went into the sauna for 10 minutes to rid myself of toxins. I've eaten two small meals, a protein shake, and a multivitamin today. I waited four hours after my last meal before ingesting the substances. I prepared hot chocolate to drink with the shrooms. Setting. Today is the 11th of the 11th of the 11th. A reason for ritual. The trees decided to rid themselves of leaves today as well. The time was right. I've converted my bedroom into a shamanic sanctuary. My mattress pad is on the floor, covered with soft pillows and blankets, while my bed just has a comforter and one pillow. I've unplugged most of the electronics in my room, except for my laptop and phone. I plan on laying in my bed, in total darkness, listening to Spongle and Native American Icaros through my speakers. My phone will be left on record mode, in case I want to record my thoughts. I journey, alone. Start. 9.09pm. Ate one gram of mushrooms, drinking hot chocolate to mask the taste. 
quarter past nine. Consume 25 milligrams of MXE and orange juice. 9.35. I begin to feel off baseline. I feel a little drunk and I can tell that the MXE is beginning to take effect. 9.40. I started the soundtrack I prepared for this night. I place 50 milligrams of MXE and 20 milligrams of 4-HOMET under my tongue and turned off all the lights. Then, I lay down in my bed and let the journey begin. The first part of this report was written during, before my trip. From here on out, I base my time estimations on the soundtrack I created. For convenience, I would like to place the zero hours mark at 9.40 when I started the soundtrack. I'm writing this the next day. I swallowed some of my saliva. It was accompanied by a really bitter taste, and I begin to notice some mild hallucinations. I could feel the synergy of all the drugs interacting with one another, fighting for dominance. Right now, I feel in control. 20 minutes. The MXE seems to be dominating the trip. I feel calm, lightweight, and very euphoric. The hallucinations alternate from the blocky, fluid-like MXE visuals to the grid-like tryptamine visuals of the mushrooms. It comes in waves, and I still feel in control of this experience. 30 minutes. I notice that the hallucinations have kicked up a notch now. I see dark trails behind my hands as I move them around, and I look around the room and realise that I'm tripping very hard and might not be in control of this for much longer. So I swallow all the powder that was left in my mouth and I washed it down with water and orange juice, swishing the liquid around my mouth. I notice that I can't feel the bottom of my mouth at all where the chemicals were, but I don't care. I just lay back down in my bed and feel waves of energy coursing through my body. Right now, I have no nausea, feel calm, and are very comfortable. 40 minutes. Things get very weird. The hallucinations begin to become real, and time starts to lose meaning. My consciousness becomes fluid, and starts to break apart like a liquid. One hour, question mark. At this point, ordinary reality was completely obliterated. I felt like I'd broken a hole in the space-time continuum and every human being on Earth was aware that this had occurred. I will now attempt to describe what happened as best I can, but I can only tell it as a story. I'd embarked on a shamanic journey. Many have travelled this path before. At first I was lost, so I allowed the spirits to guide me, which was my only source of comfort, but there were many of them to choose from, many enticing me, but I wouldn't let myself get taken over by them, because I couldn't tell which ones were good, and which ones were evil. This happened in cycles. Every time that I left the comfort of a spirit, I came closer to death. It was a process, and I realized that reality was a creation of my mind, and that I had become my environment. Once I became more aware of this new form of existence, I realized that what I thought were spirits were actually shamans around the world. They were people on Earth right now, that were connecting with me in this hyperdimensional energy field. I entered a connection with a shaman that was somewhere in South America, and through him, I began to learn how to use my new powers. We began to create energy fields, but I would struggle against the connection. I was concerned that I was participating in black magic of some kind. I didn't know if it was good or bad, but when I struggled against the connection, I was brought closer to death. At some point, I thought I was actually dying. I was on the cusp of being alive and dead. But something deep within me said, No, you will not die. You must choose to live. But how? I asked. You must become, it replied. I began to wave my hands around in a circular motion, which was responsible for forming the world around me. I started to take deep breaths in and out, in and out. That's how I knew that I was alive. But whenever I reached what I thought was the peak, I'd come back down to the cusp of death and was stuck in this loop. Every time that I came back down, I was closer to death itself. Through this process, I became more and more powerful. Terence McKenna himself was with me and he told me, You can do it. You can do it. Don't give up. Remember what you have learned. 
every single occurrence in your life has led to this moment. This is real. This is actually happening. Novelty is reaching the infinite point. The end of history. I felt as if I was in a birthing process. I could feel the presences of the DMT elves, and they encouraged me to do something. At first it was very difficult, and I thought it was impossible. But deep down inside me, I realized that I was the Messiah. I was the one. I was Neo. I would succeed where everybody before me had failed. This was the purpose of my life. This was why I existed. I began to move around my bed in strange motions, and I felt like I was hatching out of a cosmic egg. I started to become more godlike. And then, I became God. I realized that I am responsible for all of existence. I became the One, which is the universe, which is the mind. She did it. You finally did it. You fulfilled the prophecy. All of the elves were cheering me on. I could hear thousands of people cheering. This is what the machine elves had always wanted us to do. And I felt like the first human to do it. I felt like I had accomplished something of extreme importance. At this point, I became the entire universe. I was reality. I was existence. I was all that was. I had become. I had the ability to gather all that is, and I held infinite in the palm of my hand. I understood how the whole was contained in each part, and everything was music. I had become spongled. You are me, and I am you. There was no more fear. I was in complete control of everything. I was God, and the very spirits that came to guide me. Three hours and thirty minutes. Even though I'd become a god, I realized that there was a reason we exist in an animal body, our living vessel. Returning to my animal body from the higher realm was extremely therapeutic. All of the problems and worries in my life are insignificant. It was a true rebirth. Once I regained control of my body, I went to the bathroom and took the best feeling piss of my entire life. I still felt like I was responsible for all of existence, even though now I just had an animal body. I remember turning on the heat in my room and feeling as if I was the heat itself. We are the gods, which is the universe, which is our mind. Commentary I must warn anybody that has read this far that there are huge risks involved with what I did. I could easily see how somebody with a weaker mind could have gone permanently insane, or died. My ayahuasca experience and knowledge of shamanism, combined with a strong will to live, was what prevented my trip from being bad. With that being said, this was the most profound and therapeutic experience of my entire life. What lessons did I learn? Free will exists. We must choose to live. We are in control of our existence. We are the gods, which is the universe, which is our mind. So we're coming at you today with one of the most profound dissociative trip reports I've ever seen. Usually, trip reports on ketamine and MXE and other dissociatives of the like they usually just focus on the feeling of the experience rather than the extremely deep layers of the whole, which is what you get into when you take a high dose of a dissociative such as K or MXE. And MXE is much more potent than ketamine and other dissociatives. So you can only imagine what sort of places this chemical can take you if you are to delve into the hole and this user in particular he describes the intense euphoria from dissolving the self via these extremely potent dissociatives 
It's very different to an ego death or ego dissolution experience on a classic psychedelic. It almost seems to be a shortcut to heaven in a sense. And it's a real treat to read because you often don't see this with these sort of reports. I think you'll enjoy this one, so stick around for it. How can one live with such knowledge? Methoxetamine and Cannabis by The Explorer Me, male in his early twenties, graduate student, stable personal life, introverted, philosophical, analytical. If it matters, I'm gay and non-religious. My prior drug history. Smoked a bowl of weed for the first time in December 2011. Since then, I've tried in order DMT, Salvia, MDMA, LSD, DXM, DOC, LSA, DPH, only once. Nitrous, ketamine, mushrooms, crystal meth, methylphenidate, and 5-MeO-MIPT. Also the usual litany of alcohol, tobacco, nicotine, and spice. And finally, methoxetamine. I fell in love with dissociatives after the first time I tried DXM, in February 2012. I spent two months moving from a high first plateau dose, 195mg for me, all the way up to a mid third plateau dose, 850mg. I had many wonderful nights with DXM, exploring its inner realm potential, listening to music as I never had before, and allowing the drug to take me to new regions of the mind. Around that same time, late March, I obtained a line of ketamine, the drug I'd been longing for weeks to try, at a rave. I got home that night, tried it out, 125 milligrams insufflated, and decided that, given its relative rarity and exorbitant prices, I ought to give MXE, a fairly inexpensive, legally available analogue, a try. So I ordered a gram from a reliable vendor, waited a couple of weeks for it to arrive from overseas, and gave it a spin. It took me about a month to finish off that first gram, including about 250 milligrams that I gave away or sold to friends. I'd take oral or sublingual doses of 20 to 30 milligrams, dipping my finger into the bag and licking up little bits of the powder until I got to where I wanted to go. I was impressed with the gentle nature of the experience the way the drug allowed me to glide in and out of space effortlessly. The dissociation felt almost voluntary. If I closed my eyes, I could feel a bit removed from the world, but if I wanted to remain fully functional, I could do that too. DXM has a way of shooting you out of a cannon into the dissociative realm. MXE, much like ketamine, is clean, soft and friendly. I took doses like this many times before going to work, or with a bowl of weed at night to relax and enjoy music. I'd also attempt medium doses, 30 to 50 milligrams, often mixed in with something else such as weed, shrooms, or even DMT. These experiences were quite nice, although as a lover of visual immersive experiences, I was extremely disappointed by the fact MXE's closed eye visuals were so dull and dark. DXM and Ketamine gave me lucid dreamlike visuals. For a couple of weeks, I thought that I must have burned myself out or something, that it was my fault, not the drugs that I was seeing so little when I closed my eyes. This isn't the case. MXE is simply not a very visual drug until you take a significantly higher dose. Realising that I enjoyed MXE, I ordered another 2 grams. At first I kept experimenting with low range doses, up to about 30 milligrams. Although every couple of weeks throughout April, May and June, I'd go on slightly higher dose trips, up to about 60 milligrams. I considered these to be fairly strong experiences. They thrust me into a dreamlike state, in which I could interact with people in a detached, light, airy way, think about life from a logical, detached perspective, and enjoy music especially ambient or atmospheric music in new ways. The euphoria was incredibly pleasant and was one of the highlights of the experience. In May, I spent the night with one of my druggy friends and we decided to give the M-hole a go. 
We turned off all of the lights except for our laptops, measured out 80 milligram doses, the suggested amount for an M-hole experience according to several online sources, and closed our eyes. We were both very impressed by the experience. Music was ethereal, the space and size distortions were unbelievable, and the euphoria was breathtaking. This was a one-off thing though, and having a friend around significantly altered the experience. This was my first truly high dose MXC experience. Anyway, later in June, a few weeks ago as I'm writing this, I started using the drug more frequently in an attempt to unlock its spiritual, rather than recreational, potential. I'd make more of a conscious effort to turn the lights off, immerse myself in atmospheric music, and smoke a lot of weed to thrust me into space. Just as a side note here from personal experience, Combining cannabis with a dissociative like ketamine or MXE can seriously potentiate the experience into psychedelic levels in some way. Cannabis is a, an amazing potentiator of chemicals. It can also be a bit of a game of Russian roulette because you really don't know which way it's going to go. I'd take doses in the 50 to 70 milligram range regularly for a couple of weeks. These experiences felt otherworldly. Similar in intensity to my third plateau DXM experiences, except with less of a body load. Visuals became slightly more apparent, the euphoria ramped up, the headspace felt more immersive. I also felt like I was forgetting more of the experience upon waking up the next morning, but that wasn't too big of a deal. I was used to that from a DXM. As June turned into July, I thought that I'd once again go for the M-hole. I took an 80 milligram dose with some weed over the course of a couple of hours, and had an experience similar to the one that I'd had before with my friend, except, of course, I was alone and more able to immerse myself in the headspace. I told one of my friends that I'd gone deeper into the hole than before, and that I felt like I was truly unlocking the drug's spiritual potential. The problem was that there was this nagging doubt, I kept reading online that if you'd truly been in the hole, you'd know it, that it was like falling off a cliff. I thought that I'd been in the hole, simply because the experience had become qualitatively different than what my medium high doses have offered, but wasn't quite sure if I was right. I was wrong. It wasn't until later that I realised that my entire conception of dissociative drugs had been skewed. Given the dosage information online, I figured that the drug kind of maxed out after 80 milligrams or so, that beyond that was likely blackout or overdose. Taking 100 milligrams, for instance, always struck me as foolish. But that's not true. A person can take 80, 100, 120, 150 milligrams of MXE. 80 milligrams is only the entrance point to the M hole, not the peak experience that the drug offers. So I decided to go for it. I decided to really try to enter the M hole for real. A few days ago I weighed out 30 milligrams, a nice way to begin the experience. An hour went by and I snorted 30 milligrams more, bringing me to my typical medium high level headspace. Another 30 minutes went by and I snorted another 20 milligrams, another 30 minutes, another 20 milligrams plus a bowl of weed. Then I turned the lights off and entered the hole. At first, I was overcome by stereotypical feelings associated with first time entrance to the dissociative hole. Did I take too much? Am I going to be okay? Am I dying? If I stop fighting this experience, am I going to black out? But I reminded myself that the drug is already in my system that I didn't take anything unsafe, and that this was simply an incredibly intense altered state of consciousness that if I'm going to enjoy, I'm going to need to surrender to the experience. Calming myself down only took about two minutes, and then I let go. Then, my head was filled with a new thought. Holy shit, this is it. This is the fucking hole. I'm in. I rested my head against my pillow and my mind took over. I was then given a bizarre cosmic tour through the never regions of my mind. Mystical architecture floating on clouds, 
Strange rooms that I'd never seen before. Unfamiliar people who somehow seemed so comforting. Intense size and space distortions like nothing I'd ever felt before. One minute the entire universe felt like it had been stuffed into a small corner. The next, I was suspended above an infinite void. Manic euphoria. Total detachment from any worldly concern. Atmospheric music gave a mystical, transcendental feel to the experience. Oh yeah, and it makes you piss like a gallon of water. Stay hydrated, kids. Anyway, that was obviously a pretty goddamn wonderful experience. So I decided to venture back into the hole the following two nights. Last night and the night before. Both times, I took 120 milligrams and smoked a bit of weed throughout. The two experiences I just had with this dose were very similar, so I'll simply recount the basic nature of it all. Keep in mind that if you seek an experience like this, you need to be alone in your room, at night, in the pitch black darkness, with your eyes closed. All of the immersion was still prominent, you're fully sucked into the wormhole. But the key feature of the hole at this level is the godlike euphoria. It feels as though you've literally entered the gates of heaven, and that God and his angels are trumpeting your arrival as the chosen one. It's as if your entire body has erupted into the best orgasm of your life, times five, while you're winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Basically, it's just perfect. It's like you're bathing in a warm, radiant, existential glow. Your entire consciousness is just absolutely immersed in a divine, godlike, ecstatic bliss. All is right with the universe. And I mean the entire universe. Everything can be placed into perspective. And anything, I mean anything at all that might be worrying you, seems irrelevant in the grand scheme of the cosmic patchwork. You get it when you're in the hole. And the very fact that you exist is reason for a jubilant, joyous celebration of the soul. You are in love with yourself and your existence, and it's an unparalleled state of transcendental contentness. You feel, in a word, like God. I successfully replicated this experience. This happened two nights in a row, so I know it's not a fluke. So what do I do, now that I know that I can go to heaven whenever I want? If only I pay about two dollars for a line of white powder. How does a person live with the knowledge that all of the kings that have ever existed, all of the most richest, powerful, successful people in the world, all of the spiritualists and religious leaders and monks of the world, have never felt such bliss as I have, with this little white powder, synthesized for the first time just a couple of years back? It's better than any sex I've ever had, any accomplishment I've ever achieved, any friendship or love I've ever known. How am I to process this? My life is great. The whole helps me see how wonderful my sober life is. My sober life is fantastic. I'm a very blessed person. My friends, and my best friend in particular, are amazing. I have a boyfriend with whom I'm completely sexually and emotionally compatible. I've accomplished many interesting and unusual things. I'm on track to earn a doctorate one day. I've met my idols and role models. I've been to many concerts and raves. I have a good home life and unlimited opportunities await me. My life is great, but the whole is better. Nothing compares to what I felt in the whole. So what do I do now? Is it okay to go into the whole a lot? What are the dangers, emotionally and intellectually and physically? Should I go back yet again tonight? Why wouldn't a person want to? Why would anyone deny the opportunity to do this again, over and over? I'm not sure how I need to move forward. This isn't really how I'd have expected myself to respond to this situation, if someone had told me I'd be in it. But why would I have ever expected myself to be in this situation? It's totally absurd, and nobody would believe me if I told them anyway, so why bother? I now know how to enter a state of godlike, ecstatic, euphoric bliss any time I want. I mean, isn't this completely absurd? What does a human being do when he's given this ability? 
What is one to do with knowledge like this? Does he tell others about it? Does he devote much of his life to studying and exploring it? Does he arrange a routine around it? Oh yeah, I'd much rather spend my nights refreshing internet sites and fapping rather than going to heaven and experiencing divine cosmic bliss. I mean, what is this? It's a farce. This is an absurd scenario on an almost literary scale. How can a person live with this knowledge? How can I look at life in the same way after experiencing this? Someone once told me that Anne Shulgin hated ketamine because she never knew of anyone who could handle it. I now see exactly what she meant. I've experienced heaven, and I know that I can experience it over and over again whenever I want, and I don't know how to proceed. One would think that it would excite me and make me want to tell everyone all about it, right? But I feel like trying to explain it to anyone would be ridiculous and impossible. Instead, it's just left me strangely content and kind of objective and detached. The whole is a secret inner realm where everything is perfect. I can go to it whenever I want. Again, I ask, how does a human being confront this knowledge? The drug is not physically addictive. It will not destroy my body, unless I use it idiotically, which ain't gonna happen. There's no hangover. It's a wonder drug. What's the catch? What's the catch to having instant nirvana and a little white powder? I know, I know, it sounds like a tragedy in the making. Disaster over the long term waiting to happen. But it looks so perfect from here. I'm going to hand my MXE to my best friend tonight. So it's at his house rather than mine. I don't want it to tempt me. I want to go back tonight, I really do. And I'm afraid that I might do it if I have it with me. I don't want to build a massive tolerance. And I don't want to abandon life and become obsessed with the whole. So right now I'm sitting here, fixated on the whole, trying to figure out right now what role it will play in my life. I'm absolutely perplexed. I'm not sure what to do. I just feel like something is different now. I'm alternately nervous, excited, content, confused, amazed, enlightened, perplexed, scared, hopeful. Enter the dissociative hole at your own risk. If you want to go to heaven, experience nirvana, feel ultimate cosmic bliss, and achieve a rapturous state of being, you can do it for the price of a Big Mac. You can know what it's like to be God. But how will you live with that knowledge? Profoundly startled. A DPT, methoxetamine and nitrous oxide report by Pewter G. I had been both looking forward to and dreading trying DPT for a while. After hearing many reports of users becoming uncomfortable and overwhelmed, as well as many reports of profound serenity, powerful visions and beautiful scenery, I had built up an incredible respect for the drug with never having tried it. I adore both the mind-expanding visionary classic psychedelics, such as LSD, psilocybe mushrooms, 2CE, DMT, as well as the wonky, weird, introverted, sit-your-ass-down-and-trip realm of dissociatives like ketamine and methoxetamine. So DPT seemed like it would be a perfect addition to my medicine bag from what I'd heard of it. However, when I ended up being given some by one of my psychonaut friends, I found I was very apprehensive about putting this particular substance into my body, despite being quite typically eager to try the rest of my new selection, 2CT7, Myprosin, Mitosin, 2CP, 2CI. After reading many, many, many experience reports and the primer online a couple of times, I felt like I was mentally prepared to try it on for size. Now it all came down to finding the perfect moment, whatever that means. I had decided at work that day in mid-May that the perfect moment would be that night, for no other reason than because of the tried and true, it's now or never reasoning. I was quite excited about trying it right up until the point where I was at home with the syringe full and ready to go, when the task seemed a lot more ominous and severe than fun and insightful. I had dissolved 30 micrograms in 3cc of water with heat, which turned slightly opaque, a dark red and smelled of the jungle junk aroma I associate with DMT. 
As I drew it up, the cotton ball I was using turned brown like dried blood. I did this hours before I planned on using it, because I was nervous and knew that I'd be more likely to do it if it was already drawn. But when I saw this reaction, I was a little less than amped. After going to the movies to see a crappy R-rated college flick, a few failed attempts at sleeping, and quite a bit more time questioning whether this was the right night, I had done meprosin, mushrooms and methoxetamine a couple of days prior. I read some final trip reports and smoked some bong before taking the plunge. I put on a Milo.Nade set, Ottoman Audible, and stuck the syringe in my left thigh. I opted for IMing mostly because IMing is the route I am most comfortable with when compared to snorting or smoking, but also because of a lack of product. I was intent on going all the way in with this one, and had heard that many users much prefer this route to smoking, railing or ingesting. I decided I wanted to keep the lights on after reading reports of some people being touched or massaged by spirit entities. I was only going to be using 30mg to just get a feeling for the drug, but I know from experience that having the lights off in a room during a dissociating experiment can impact the journey profoundly, and I was not keen on entity contact during this assay. I smoked a bong hit, laid back and waited for the effects to settle in. Soon after I noticed my hands and feet becoming clammy. This I realised was more of a sensation than a physical reaction, because my hands and feet were warm to the touch and dry, but this soon developed into cold sweating extremities. My mouth also felt pasty despite ample saliva, more noticeable than usual when I get stoned. I began to feel a rush I typically associate with low doses of salvia, like a sort of psychedelic panic where it feels like something big is very wrong. At this dose, however, the effect was more subtle than salvia, with me only observing the panic without getting caught up in it, but it did carry on to a faster tempo which permeated the whole experience. All of a sudden, everything in my visual field, levered by the spotlight of focus, was teeter-tottering up and down slightly, relatively quickly, giving a whooshing effect. At first I would not have defined it as shaking like many others do, as it was slower than shaking in my opinion. I would define it more as a fast wiggle. However, I could easily see that that sensation could be nauseating to others, and would probably result in SBS if that force was applied to an infant. I only ever felt slight inklings of potential nausea, but there was no vomiting and I was more excited than uncomfortable. My headspace became more noticeable, like my mind's eye was widening and deepening to become more of an empty space than a screen to project thoughts on, which weighed my head down. I soon noticed the colours in my room intensify slightly, with neon green and saturated purple, the colour of magic, on the edge of perception and watched as a vivid, almost jello-looking rainbow halo appeared around the hanging lamp in my room, which itself was climbing up and down its chain, the wide metal lampshade teeter-tottering. The light on my computer was going through cycles, each about 30 to 45 seconds long, where it would start motionless, steadily get more excited and release its energy by shaking and then vibrating, until it was back to being calm and slow drifting rather than vibrating, until it got excited again. I reflect that the visual distortions are cartoonish, as described in many other reports, like everything was rotoscoped as in the film adaptation of P.K. Dick's A Scanner Darkly. There was a definite push to lie down and close my eyes, but the lack of mental imagery made this much less interesting. The only closed eye visuals were psychedelic static, barely noticeable, yet active like the rest of my vision, swaying, wiggling and shaking slowly. I decided at T plus 25 that I needed to do either more DPT or something else if I wanted to get anything profound out of this substance during this experiment. I was stuck halfway into the experience, essentially barely affected by the distortions and sensations despite being immersed in them. I decided, after smoking some weed to little effect, that 25 milligrams of methoxetamine I emmed, half my usual amount when mixing, would be exactly what this experiment needed. This amount would act more as a catalyst to the DPT than anything to write home about in itself. 
I have used MXE with many psychedelics before to help explore them to great effect. It seems to replace perception of the drug's effect with the drug itself, facilitating becoming completely engrossed in the experience. I weigh it out on a milligram scale and injected it into my left buttock at T plus 35 minutes. I lay back down and waited to see what this will turn into. As the MXE kicked in, I noticed dancing shadows on my ceiling made from the after images of the light imprinted in my eye. They started off as shadows, but I soon saw them as spirits, with the impression of leading heads and tailing bodies, much like a comet. My long hair in front of my face, now much more noticeable than usual, felt as if it was flowing with energy, swaying and crimping slightly. I cannot even imagine what would happen if I turn off the music at this point, because this mellow, dubby set has become an integral part of this experience, with all activity mediated by the sounds, grounding the jarring with the serene. So important is the music that it feels almost as if it is a part of the ceremony of this drug. This set gave a very meditative warm atmosphere, and it is only now, half an hour and 25 milligrams of MXE into it, that I appreciate this importance fully. The panic mellowed out a little, but the rushing remained, and was so powerful that it, along with the deeper mind's eye weighing my eyelids down, would make my eyes flutter closed to observe whatever visions were on the other side, which were still staticky, but were developing shapes and lines rapidly. Since my fear of entity contact had been completely shattered within the last five minutes, when one of the shadow spirits zoomed by my right ear from behind my head, I decided it was time to turn off the lights. Back in bed, the dancing shadows on the ceiling, which is still somewhat lit by my computer screen, continue to zoom around and chase each other. As I closed my eyes, the fuzz, continuing to take on more distinct forms, got more of a misty quality and was illuminated slightly. It was like watching small monochrome clouds up close until I saw visions of hands, both indistinct, uncountable, yet clearly styled, coming together at the fingertips in blurry madras in the middle of my headspace. They were all Janus style, sacredly cartoonish, with the fingers and the thumbs curved and pointed. They swam around each other, a screen hiding the back of my new headspace. This was almost as mystical and spiritual as what they had opened up to reveal. A bemused Tibetan Buddha head, lit from an unseen source directly beneath, pivoting back and forth inside my head. Only the part of the image that was being lit was visible, with the spots that would normally be taken up by shadows on a corporeal face, which with the extreme light angle was most of the face, simply not there, leaving empty space instead. There were points where he appeared as if he was a transparent Russian doll, with images on the inside equally as distinct as the outer form and becoming more clear with focus, both seeing through the image and at the image. I want to describe it as many images of the Buddha superimposed on top of each other and swimming around, over and through each other like the hands, but the 3D nature of the image called for more of a Russian doll analogy. In no way was it concrete enough to have this analogy hold true, apart from a consistent outer shell, varying in intensity but always present, like a Buddha aura. Despite being indistinct, the image was shown with such clarity that there was no denying its existence. I was in awe and reverence. I, for the first time for myself, had found a true entheogen. It could just as easily have been Jesus, Vishnu or Ra that I saw, but this Buddha was what found its way in. I had to laugh at how incredibly awe-inspiring and grandiose the vision was, but it was less of a ha <laughs> laugh and more of a ha <laughs> ha laugh. The shadow spirits were still zooming around the room when I opened my eyes, but the image, if you can call it that, clung to my closed eye visuals for at least 10 minutes. I could tell he was being persistent, making it perfectly clear to me that I saw what I saw. The shadows, now seeming more like small gods begging for belief than spirits simply haunting, also had more distinct characteristics, 
Some elvish, cheerful and good-spirited with slightly feline features. Some dark clouds with gaping holes for mouths. Almost Dementor or Ringwraith-like. I knew I was protected by my vision, so even the most malevolent looking of them was peered at with interest and curiosity. There was a religious and spiritual undertone to everything about the experience. From the patterning, between misty and cloudy, flowing, monochrome, with many lines, angles and spirals distorting my room, yet somehow linked to the higher nature of the drug, to the body sensations like pure awe, wonder and worship flowing through my body, which comes close to describing it. I could not sit or lie in a way that didn't convey to me some sort of yogic significance. My room was, including the garbage bags of clothes on the floor and the clutter on the desk, in perfect feng shui. The music, massively important as a grounding and calming agent by this time, was ancient and mystic. I did wonder about tantric sex, but my life partner, along with that thought, will remain in a different city for another couple of months, making it easy to stay in the current experience. I soon remember reading about the Temple of the True Inner Light briefly, and their use of DPT as a sacrament. I felt like I could be their next prophet just from this one experience, and immediately after the visions reduced back to fuzz, I got on the internet and looked up their website and some forums about them. I was disappointed with what I found. My opinion, too much Jesus, not enough personal interpretation, but was still filled with such serenity from having witnessed what I had, and with a renewed faith in psychedelics as in theogens. As the sensations and visuals became less engaging, my mind turned to trying to decipher and understand the experience. I came to the realisation that I had actually used DPT a couple of years prior, having been sold to me as a half gram of ketamine at a club. I knew it wasn't K after trying some at the event, because it didn't feel like K, what with the visual distortions and lack of defined dissociation, and it made my nose much more sore than K usually does. I must have had around 75 milligrams of the half gram after splitting it up with my friends, which I went home with and railed in bed to a much different experience than ketamine. Although it wasn't what I thought I had paid for, I still found myself interested in trying it again. The person I had got it from had sold me the last of her stash, and was herself utterly convinced it was ketamine, so there was no chance of getting more of it. I had been saying without certainty that it could have been DMT because of the short, colourful nature of the experience, and had stopped thinking about it after rationalising it that way. There was always a feeling of uncertainty about the experience, since I had figured it would be one of those things I would never know for sure. It was an odd eureka moment when I figured it out, because I had been wondering about that stuff for years, and to have such a sudden realisation being handed to me without any personal effort was, although amusing, almost jarring. I remembered the odd rushing dissociating feeling, the vivid and cartoonish visual distortion with lights reminiscent of melting jello, and watching a light on my computer in the dark room drift and wiggle up and down. When I looked closer at the light, I could see a spaceship or hovercraft. After remembering all this quite clearly, I tried to focus on a green light on my laptop to see if it would do the same. After a little bit, the area around the light was reduced to fuzz, and the little green light took off, slowly zooming and shaking around that area. It even looked like the spaceship from years ago, rounded and insectoid like a housefly, but steampunk styled. I was in an amazing mood, and wanted to prolong and intensify the mystic vibes for as long as possible, so I decided I would take a hit of nitrous to see how they mix. After my nitrous, my prosin and 2CE adventure, I had high hopes for nitrous mixed with any psychedelic, and since the visions were dying down, I wanted to see how far it could take me. I took a bong toke and cracked one canister into a balloon at around T plus 1 hour and 30 minutes. I got back into bed and took it in a couple of breaths. And, uh, now what? Absolutely nothing spectacular happened with this combo during this experience. Why isn't it working? Maybe I have a tolerance. From using a single canister twice a month for the last couple months? Maybe that part of the brain is already being stimulated, 
or DPT already feels like nitrous. It might have been that Buddha had been the peak and that any attempt to getting back there during this trip was futile. Whatever, the experience rolls on, with amorphous chunky cauliflower open eye patterning dominating my visuals, arranging itself to the music, which turned briefly into some unfocused monster totem spirit crumping during one particularly fresh glitch hop breakdown. Okay, maybe the nitrous did do something. As the unfocused fast patterning tapers off, I realise that there is quite a noticeable and slightly distracting soreness at the site of injection, only slightly worse than the flu vaccine. Again, religious undertones, spirit medicine, it hurts, but it works. That spot remained tender for two days after the injection, but went back to normal soon after. I made a mental note to never again take DPT in the leg. By T plus two hours and 30 minutes, I was pretty much back from the trip. The set was over, the bong hits did nothing, and I felt safe turning my computer off. But I was stuck in an odd spot in terms of integrating the experience into my life. I wanted to tell people about it and share the amazing knowledge that DPT is a direct way of facilitating worship of deities, but I knew so many of my friends were against research chemicals that even if I did tell people about the vision, Many would be too hung up on the fact that I injected a chemical that no one knows anything about into one of my most precious limbs, and obviously saw some crazy life-altering shit to even think about how that experience could be relevant in their lives. How would I go about explaining the significance of this to my mother? I was also experiencing an odd dichotomy when thinking about using it again myself, although there was a part of me that was incredibly curious about exploring this at slightly higher doses ASAP, my body and memories of how rattling the experience was were telling me not to use it again for a while. The experience both calls for further investigation and begs to stand on its own. I found this paradox even when thinking about writing this report. I wanted to explore the drug more before saying the report is done, but I also wanted to finish the report before trying more. I did try it again to elaborate on some of the sensations and visuals. Seeing Buddha in itself was, although serene, almost unnerving, as I really was not expecting something that unbelievably profound. The effects faded away slowly, leaving nothing more than the cartoonish, glassy, jello -y quality, reduced to mild but noticeable for days. Classic MXE insomnia, asleep by T plus 3 hours and 30 minutes though, and an intense urge to find meaning for this experience which continued for the next days as I wrote this report and integrated the experience into my life. I noticed that even a week after, as the effects of the drug contorted my HPPD, as all psychedelics do for me to some extent, adding a certain flavour to my daily life until my next experience. My closed eye patterning, which is usually just static, gained more coherent forms, like clouds well educated in human experience trying out different shapes until finding one that fits. Stretching weeks after the experience, I would see visions like an ornate ivy covered lamppost, a stereotypically creepy young white girl with long brown braids, and indistinct monsters in architecture that would only vaguely resemble something concrete. The greatest respect for a drug since my LSD days stopped me from taking any DPT for a while after the experience. I couldn't stop thinking about it, but unlike other drugs that have made me feel this way, I felt like I had to wait long to use it out of respect for the experience. This was one of the most significant trips of my life, and I was in no hurry to push myself into it again. Although I do take spirituality and religion seriously, I was also one to take it with a grain of salt, and considered it something best suited to other people. Since the experience, my belief in deities has become strong, although still indistinct and centred around animism and mysticism, with some classic monotheism sprinkled on top for good measure, from this one experience. Just from this trip, I not only felt much more at peace with the world and myself, but gained a new perspective, nay, appreciation, of religious philosophy, particularly of Asiatic religions. If this substance can expose me, an agnostic with no rigid beliefs, to as profound a religious and spiritual revelation as it did, 
I can only imagine how people with a definite deity would react. I had become disconnected from my environment, body, obligations and stresses, and connected to something higher, spiritual, all-encompassing, yet undefinable and vague. No rules were laid out, no prophecies made, just a feeling and a vision were had, leaving the significance of this experience to guesswork, and, to a certain extent, moralistic reasoning. I reasoned, quite simply and in no new way, that the community should work together to keep the peace and ensure that everyone not only has their physical and mental needs met in a way that lets them create their own future, but has the opportunity to explore themselves, their faith and their beliefs, with whatever catalyst they see fit, as long as they respect their obligations to nurture and protect their body and mind, and family and community, and impede no one else on their journey of exploration and discovery. There is a spirit, both within and around all of us, that can, nay, must be called upon, through meditation, prayer, and theogen use, etc., to achieve a greater understanding of our place in this world, and diffuse our material stresses. I do plan on trying DPT again at the 40 milligrams range with, if necessary, a canister of nitrous as the initial booster, and 25 milligrams of MXC as the sustainer. But every time I think about using it again, I simultaneously think about how I still need to find meaning for my time with Buddha.